What's a milliner? Well, it's a very specific British word, which comes from Milan, because all the first hat makers in Britain were Italian, and they'd come and they settled in the north of London, and they were milliners, i.e. they made women's hats as opposed to hatters who made men's hats. But what's a milliner? It's somebody who creates a hat, which is an expression. It can be an expression of themselves, it can be an expression of the client, it can be an expression of something else. And the good milliners, hopefully, combine all three. I've made many collections, you know, over my career, which is gulp, 43 years. Uh, but inspiration comes every day. I live my life and put it into a hat. However, collections are thematic, so it could be about the 14th century, it could be about outer space, it could be once when I spent time in hospital and then I did all jewelled bones as evening tiaras. So it can be anything at all. Um, I mean, I've made a hat like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I've made a hat like a very chic summer straw inspired by Saint-Tropez. The world is not your oyster, but your hat. I think it's impossible to be a milliner nowadays and not be influenced by the past. And actually, I think that idea of what's past, present and future is sort of no longer relative to fashion anyway. I think it's, that's an outdated concept. But of course, the great milliners like Albuy, all the milliners from the 40s and 50s, uh, Sven, who was the milliner of Jacques Fath, Vladizio de Tanville, who was the milliner for Balenciaga, Mitsu Bricard, who was the milliner for Christian Dior, I mean, they've all influenced me. But I remember Manolo Blahnik once telling me, he's the fantastic shoe creator, he said you have to be better informed than any fashion designer and then you have to forget it all and just do as you please. And basically that's what I do. British clients, French clients, yes, they're looking for something different. I mean, in a funny way, English clients want to look French and French clients want to look British. <laughs> How fabulous do I look? So that's the entente cordiale, I think. It's interesting when I'm making a hat for a, a, a private client because often they come in and they have an idea of what they want to have. But sometimes some clients have no idea at all. It's really sort of the fusion of two minds coming together. There will be an event. Right. So I want something obviously a bit vampirish, and I know I've come to the best place. Okay, ah. let me just show you. Oh my because goodness. this oh my goodness. goes like that. Because the thing is, we could attach this to the band, but then it sort of becomes no, 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 more no, no, no. confusing. I love I mean, this. I mean, that we can make a little bit tighter, um, but that's okay. great. So amazing. You are a genius. It's, That's quite wonderful. It is a total work of art. And that is the same when I'm working with a fashion designer. For example, when, I'm, when I first started and I was working with somebody like Zandra Rhodes, or when I'm working with Maria Grazia Curie now, or Tom Brown, it's really a, a friendship or a conversation that you have, and then the hats are born out of that. I think that's the way it needs to be. Sometimes it is, I found this beautiful hat on holiday and I'd like to have something like that. But even then, you know, every stitch is a decision and that decision is based on the collaboration. But you could say that's true for a private client too. So it's, um, hats are communication. You know, when people come into the shop, I don't necessarily have an idea of what they will want to have. I look them up and down. Sometimes they want to have something which looks like them, but sometimes they want to look like somebody else. You know, it's great, but it doesn't suit you. No? No. Okay. And this has got more height. That's much better. I adore this hat. Yeah. This collection, which is my summer collection, was somewhat autobiographical, mm -hmm. and this is based on Bodnant Gardens in North Wales, oh. where my mother used to take me as a child. And, 
even though I did want to be watching, you know, Thunderbirds on TV or whatever, I did appreciate that Bodmin Gardens was a beautiful place. And hydrangeas. So this is, again, it's on a little elastic, oh. but it's really, really pretty. So tell me about the dress. The dress is basically blue and pink. Blue and pink. Bias cut, sort of skinny. I think it's a sleeves. Jacket, long sleeves. Long sleeves. And I'll wear a little lace gloves to match. Right. And I love watching you being so creative. It's thrilling, very moving. Your well, expertise is oh, commendable. I think what we can do is have a little sort of like almost like a scarf thing coming yes, around yeah, with little it. flowers on it. Love it. And the great thing is about wearing a hat is that that dream is very easy to apply to yourself quickly. In clothing it becomes costume, but in a hat somehow it's lighter, it's more superficial, it's more fun, therefore you can assume that other persona, that other mask, convincingly. When I create a collection, there's some things which are slightly familiar. I'm 66, so of course they're going to be familiar. It's not that you have to challenge yourself, but you have to have a new point of view. Especially for my next season's collection, it's based on Sibylle de saint Fal, who is my first ever assistant, obviously French, and myself and our work together. And I thought, what is the most obvious French hat? And so often I've been walking down the Rue de Rivoli and I've seen miniature Eiffel Towers. When I'm in Paris working, I run past the Eiffel Tower when I'm jogging in the morning. And it's the most famous symbol of France. So I thought I had to make a hat like that. I never have done. But it's a bit like the Scaparelli shoe hat. That hat is a beautiful shape on the head, number one. And it happens to look like a shoe. So I'm trying to keep that mentality in my head when I'm creating this hat. I wanted this hat to look like the most spontaneous. I wanted it to look like a glance at the Eiffel Tower. I don't want really it to look like the Eiffel Tower at all. It's just like you've looked over your shoulder and you've seen it so you know that you're in Paris. It's got to have that lightness, fragility, sense of fun. I mean, eventually it's a party hat. Mm -hmm. Quite often people ask me, what's my favourite hat and why? But you're not supposed to do that. That's like naming your favourite child. <laughs> you go to hell for doing that. I don't know, it's strange. When I've created a hat, often I don't like it. And that's part of the creative process to push you on to the next thing because you're trying to resolve an artistic question. And I think in retrospect, you can see hats which are favourites for very different reasons. I would say that this hat which is called Roy Rose Royce, is one of my favourites. Why? Because, in a way, it's very, very classic. It's made from the most classic of millinery materials. It's black velvet and red satin. And it's almost a top hat shape. And I've always loved top hats. Not only because they're particularly British, but I think they suit men, women and children. But somehow I think they're quite sexy too. And I love this because it's sort of masculine form but with the femininity of having a rose within it. And that's why it's called Rose Royce. And the shape is lovely and fluid. And um, yeah, I guess you want to see me with it on. It might look terrible. Yeah, it goes on like that. <laughs>